We'll just work with spectral theory. I think I'm going to skip working on chapter 9. Chapter 9, well, there's not any time left now, <laughs> is the uh, theory for the bounded self adjoint um, linear operators, which is pretty applicable. Um, but I found the, the modern physics more exciting a little bit, and we're still not out of the spectral theory, chapter 7, anyway. So I think we better do the special theory for today and um, and see where we can, see if there's any time left okay so this will be the last lecture okay um, so let's are there any questions about the, the uh, spectrum right now? Okay. You said you were doing your homework, so do, you haven't run into anything you have questions about right now. Okay. All right. So let's have a look at the, some of the theory here. So spectral, spectral properties. Of a bounded linear operator. On a complex Banach space, so we're going to assume we have a Banach space and we're going to assume we have the bounded linear operator. Um, back in notes 11 I skipped something that was a good theorem or helping lemma 7.2-3 so we probably I'm going to have to at least write that up on the board um, this probably wouldn't be a bad idea to go through it but let's just let's just recall that 7.2-3 okay let x be a complex bonus space Okay, and T from X to X, the um, bounded linear operator. Uh, not bounded yet, just a linear operator. Then we're going to have, so we're going to consider just a little bit more general linear operator. And then, and let lambda be in the resolvent set, and we'll have to recall what that is again. Okay. So requirements R1 through R3 hold. Okay. And assume either A, T is bounded, excuse me, closed. I'm going to say, I'm going to go ahead and just follow the way it is in the book. Either closed or B, T is bounded. Okay, then the resolvent uh, of T is defined on all of X and is bounded. Okay. So then the result becomes a bonded linear operator from X to X. Okay. Um, that's the lemma. Okay, how does it go? Let me see if I can find my notes on this. I don't want to read it out of the book. Um, I think I left those. That's the one thing I left upstairs. Okay. All right. Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay, so what are what is let's recall what the resolvent set is again. The resolvent set is you have the three conditions R one. The resolvent exists. That is X 
that means that t minus lambda i is 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 injective. That means t is injective. Okay. Well, actually, no. Just t minus lambda i is injective, not t is injective. T minus lambda i is injective. You gotta be a little bit careful about that because if lambda is an eigenvalue, then okay. Oh. Then uh, the null space is not the zero space. Okay. So, so again, if that would not be the case, so t being injective is not the same thing as t minus lambda i being injective. Good. Is everybody clear about that? Okay. Okay. Two. is that R lambda is bounded and the third condition to be in the resolvent set lambda is in row of T if means these three hold, all three, all R1 through R3 hold and then R3 is the um, domain of R lambda is dense in X. Okay. So, how do we prove uh, that A implies this conclusion? Okay, let's call this conclusion star. I think I'll call that star. Okay. So, we'll suppose A. Proof of A. A implies star. Okay. What are we going to do? We're going to look at T closed, right? Assume T is closed. Then also T sub lambda equals T minus lambda I is closed. I noticed at least one person in their homework used this fact from uh, uh, one of the homework exercises in uh, chapter 4.13. How does that work out? What's the proof? Um, actually, there's something else that's being used. I'm sorry, this is close. How does that work out? You just uh, let x n. So what are you going to do? Use 413. What's the basic technique? 413-3, which I think you're going to have to use somewhere in your final exam too. Let x n go to x where x n belongs to. Um, here is the domain of x is all, excuse me, the domain of T is all of X, okay? So in general, you'd, Xn is in the domain of T, but that's equal to X in this case. All right, so let Xn converge to something in the space, okay? Um, and, and T of Xn, and assume, also assume, let, assume that, uh, that the, Images T of X N also converge to something. Okay. Then, of course, by 413, since you're assuming T is closed, then Y is equal to T of X. Okay. Okay. So similarly, um, T minus lambda I times XN goes to T, well, equals TXN minus lambda XN. What's that going to go to? Well, XN is going to X, so this is going to go to, as this goes to, uh, y minus uh, lambda x equals t minus lambda x. Okay. So then, by the same criterion, 413-3, therefore by 413-3. So we're not assuming that t is bounded here. Okay. 
we're assuming that it's closed. So we're, if, if Txn does go to something, then why is Tx? This is not proving that when Xn goes to X, then Txn goes to Tx. Okay, that's not what's being done here. If I'm assuming that Xn goes to X in such a way that Txn goes to something, then that something is Tx. That's the closure property. Okay, it's a bit odd. Okay, we're used to just thinking everything is continuous. Okay, we're not assuming continuity here. Okay, then um, now I'm going to go ahead and let xn go to x now and, um, and assume that t minus lambda i xn goes to something. Well, that goes to something if and only if txn goes to y because lambda xn is already going to lambda x. So if I call this, um, assume this goes to, assume Let's see. What is the statement of 413.3? Let me just rewrite it. Re so I'm not confusing you. It says, let the operator be given and the operator is closed if and only if the following property, if xn goes to x where xn is in the domain and t of xn goes to y, then x is in the domain and t of x is equal to y. Okay. So what we're going to do is you're going to set it up so that um, I'm going to let xn go to x and t minus lambda i xn assume assume t minus lambda equals zn goes to z, okay? Then txn goes then um, z, of course, let's put it this way, all right, suppose that's true, let's just get this right, then since xn goes to x, we have, we have lambda xn goes to lambda x, okay, and therefore, in order for this difference, Txn minus lambda Xn, to converge to something, Txn must converge to Z minus lambda X. Therefore, Txn minus um, lambda Xn converges to Z minus lambda X. Okay? And therefore, um, Z minus lambda X, just using 413-3, therefore by 413-3, since T is, uh, therefore by 413-3, I'm going in the other direction, this implies that um, that what? I'm sorry. Therefore, Txn goes to Z minus lambda X, okay? But, therefore, since T is closed, okay, let me see how this actually works. Txn goes to Z minus lambda X, therefore, uh, therefore, Z minus lambda X is equal to Oh. Is that right? Sorry, it should be plus. Okay. Sorry, I'm being a little bit stupid. T minus lambda xn, I'm, that's zn. I'm assuming that's going to z. I need to show in order to show that t minus lambda i is closed, is that z is t minus lambda i x. Okay, I need to show that's what it is. Must show. It's equal to z. Okay, I need to show that z is t minus lambda i x. t closed implies z plus lambda x is equal to t x. 
okay, by T close, because I've got Xn going to X and Txn going to something, okay? Therefore, Z plus lambda X is Tx by, uh, by 413.3. Okay, now I'm going to apply 413.3 again. Well, therefore, Tx minus lambda X is equal to Z, okay? And therefore, by the converse of 413.3, T minus lambda is closed. So I'm using 413.3 a bunch of times, going forward and backwards in the, in the uh, statement of 413.3. T minus lambda i is closed. I don't know if you're following this. I should probably write 413.3 down. You're going to have to use it. <laughs> You're going to have to use it. So let's recall 413.3, because I have a feeling people are getting stuck on this. 413.3, so I've got uh, T from DT to X. Actually, it's to Y. This is a general statement, and these are just norm spaces. Okay. <clears throat> T is closed. Okay. If and only if, whenever xn goes to x, and you're just assuming the situation that txn, where xn is in the domain, I'm not assuming anything about where x is, and txn goes to y, okay, so that somehow you do get convergence, then <coughs> Y is, e, y is equal to Tx, and X is in the domain. Okay. Otherwise, Y couldn't be Tx unless X were in the domain. But that's the situation. Here, we're not having any problem with the domain. The domain is all of X. And what I'm trying to show is that T minus lambda is closed. It's a little exercise, and I just got hung up on it a little bit. I'm trying to go too fast. So first... Um, okay. Since T is closed, when I get TXN going, maybe I didn't need to do this, this first step. What I really need to do is, this is just a restatement of one half of 413.3. Okay? This Y equals T of X. Assume now that T minus lambda I XN equals TXN minus lambda XN go, equals ZN goes to Z. Okay, then since xn goes to x, we have lambda xn goes to lambda x, therefore txn goes to z plus lambda x. Okay, and therefore, um, by the first statement that I made here, applied with y equals z plus lambda x, I get that y is equal to tx. Okay. Okay from this statement here, okay? Therefore, T X minus lambda X is Z. Therefore, okay, what did I have? I have an XN going some to X. I've got T minus lambda I XN going somewhere. I've just verified that the Z is equal to T minus lambda of X, okay? And therefore, by the converse of 413-3, T minus lambda I is closed. Okay, <laughs> finally, sorry for the slow up, but that's what you have to check, okay? Now, uh, okay. Now, next step in a implies star. That's what I want. Okay? Now that it's been erased, we'll just go ahead. Okay. By, R, by the first requirement, R1, R sub lambda equals T minus lambda I inverse exists. 
Okay. And now we have that this is also closed. Okay, I've got t minus lambda i is closed. I claim that the inverse is also closed. Why is that? That follows by 413 number 5. There's an exercise that shows you that. <clears throat> Indeed, what do I have? I've got that uh, g1, graph 1, equals a set of all t sub lambda x comma x. That's, okay, as x ranges in x, okay, This is equal, this is closed if and only if when I, re, when I reverse the things, okay, this is if the set G equals a set of all X comma T lambda X, X belongs to X, is closed. Okay? in x cross x. We're talking about closed in the Cartesian product x cross, cross x. What I've done is I've switched the coordinates. What do I mean for a set to be closed? It means if I take a sequence of the pairs that converges to some pair, then that pair is in. All right? The set, the limit pair is into the, in the set. Well, obviously, if I just switch the coordinates here, okay, we're also going to have the, the, that property preserved. So, but this is just the graph of the inverse. Okay, this is the graph of the inverse. Uh, I shouldn't put x in x. Well, yeah, that's right. This is the graph of the inverse. Okay. Okay. So the, the set of T lambda X is the domain of the resolvent. Okay, that's not the whole of X. We're not saying that yet. All right? The set of all these T lambda X's. That's the domain of the resolvent. We're not saying that's all of X. But this is all of X. I get the second coordinate here. All right. So that's closed. So what do you get from that? You get the resolvent is closed. You got... Okay, so what does that do? Okay, since it is closed and by R2 bounded, and since X is complete, we have by the previous theorem that the domain of R lambda is closed. Okay, so I'm not going to repeat that theorem, but we had that last week. Okay, since X is complete, R lambda is closed and bounded. Now, uh, we have that um, the domain of R lambda is closed. Okay. And since, therefore, by R3, the domain of R lambda is equal to X. It's equal to its own closure equals its own closure equals x. Okay. Okay. So it was another by, uh, I guess it was 413-5b. Uh, let's see that. That's a little lemma. Okay. Okay. I may not have gone over, but it's not very difficult. Okay, you do it as an exercise. Okay. So the technique is basically to use this 413 3 and use closure. Okay. So what is that? That proves that uh, what I wanted, I believe. Um, 
Because you already assumed it was bounded, and so it's got the domain is all of x. Okay. Now in part b of this theorem, okay, uh, or lemma, <clears throat> what do you get? Um, that follows from part a. I'm assume now instead of being closed, assume T is bounded. Okay. Now, because uh, let's see, what do I need? I need that uh, if by four thirteen dash five A. Now, T is closed. So if it's bounded and the domain is a closed subset of X, in this case the domain is the uh, set X itself, and T is closed. Okay. So that's a triviality. Okay. The domain has to be closed since X is closed in X. Domain of T equals X. Okay? T is closed. All right. So there's some relationships between closed and bounded. You need to know when something is closed implies it's bounded. Basically, the domain being closed, then you automatically get a bounded one. It's automatically closed as long as the domain is closed. The domain is not always closed, of course. Okay? For these operators. We've got plenty of cases. Um, but that's the case. All right. So that's the little helping lemma and the kind of review of 413-3. I thought you should see that before we use it some more. <laughs> okay. So let's go on to uh, one of the key results, the basic theorem about um, the bounded linear operators on a complex Banach space. Proof of B, assume T is bounded, then so the result follows by A. Okay. So let's go on to uh, 7.3-1. Suppose I have a bonded linear operator. T belongs to a bonded linear operator from X to itself. Uh, X is uh, complex bonic space. And assume that the norm of T is less than 1. Then I minus T has an inverse, okay, and exists as a bond linear operator from X back to itself. This is a basic basic idea. How do I calculate one of these inverse? How do you do this? This is the geometric series idea. That's how we're going to use here. How would I calculate 1 over 1 minus X? 1 plus X plus X squared plus and so on. I'm going to do the same thing with 1 over 1 minus T. <laughs> okay. Um, here's how you do it. Okay. And, indeed, I, I'm going to be able to represent I minus T inverse as I plus T plus T squared plus and so on. Okay. This is not a difficult proof. Okay. What does this mean? It means, when I write the equality here, means that I get um, norm convergence, a strong convergence of the uh, difference of the two sides. If this For an infinite series, this means that I minus T to the... Um, minus 1 minus um, i plus t plus t squared plus and so on plus t to the n. If I take that difference, so I'm going to say this operator exists, okay, it's something. Okay, and if I take, and it's a linear operator, if I take the difference of the norm between this and this, which also is another bonded linear operator, um, then this means that this goes to zero. So that's what it means to be an infinite conversion uh, in the strong sense. In operator norm. 
let's just put in bx to x. Okay? This is the bounded linear operator from x to x, and as a norm space in itself, it's just with the operator norm. Okay? As n goes to infinity. Okay. So, how do you prove that? Okay. So this this last statement just means this. I've already I've already stated that I minus d inverse is a bounded linear operator. Okay, so it already somehow exists. But actually, the key is going to be to represent it this way. Okay, in some meaningful way. So how does that work out? First, um, v x x. What are we going to bring to bear? Is a complete norm space. It's a complete uh, space. Okay, that was way back in section 10 of chapter 2. Okay, so what happens? So that's a complete space. So as long as I get a, I can construct a Cauchy sequence, I'm going to get a convergent thing. All right, so that's what we'll do. And also, you have that the j power of t in norm is less than or equal to the j power of the norm of t. All right. It's just by the definition of the norm. So what am I going to get? I'm going to say, now I'm going to look at the partial sums. If I look at the partial sum, j goes from 0 to n of the j power of t. Okay. I claim that this is Cauchy. n goes from 0 to infinity is a Cauchy sequence. in this um, bionic space, BXX. Okay. That's the Cauchy sequence. What's the basic proof? You, uh, we've done it a million times before. Uh, it seems like we've done it a million times before. What you do is you look at uh, the n plus nth partial sum minus the nth. So you look at summation j goes from proof of claim. You look at the, uh, you go from the n plus m partial sum, t to the j, minus the j goes from 0 to n, t to the j. Okay, and let's take the norm of that. I want to show that this is small for all n sufficiently large. Okay? This is less than or equal to the sum t, the, the norm of t to the j, j goes from n plus 1 to n plus m, which we argued was less than or equal to the sum of the norm of t raised to the j power, j goes from n plus 1. I might as well go all the way to infinity now. Okay? And then this is equal to, um, let's see, I bring out the first term, t to the n plus 1, then times 1 plus norm of t plus and so on, okay, higher powers, norm of t squared plus dot, 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 okay, equals the norm of t to the n plus 1 over 1 minus the norm of t by the geometric series for the numbers uh, here. I just have numbers there now, okay. And this obviously goes to 0. Uh, well, so therefore, the supremum overall m greater than or equal to 1. I'll just put this up here, proof of claim to prevent more writing. I'm going to put sup m greater than or equal to 1. Okay, of this, less or equal to the sup m greater than or equal to 1 here, okay, which is less than or equal to that, okay, equals this, which goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So that's all I need to establish. Okay, because the norm of t was less than 1. Okay, so you easily shown by the technique we've used many times before that this is a Cauchy sequence, hence uh, it converges because we, you have the Bonnach space, these bonded uh, linear operators under the operator norm do form a Bonnach space. Hence j goes from 0 to infinity t to the j, let's call this sum s, exists 
in the boundary linear operators from x to x. Okay, so we've established that this, that I do have a boundary linear operator, now I need to establish that it is i minus t inverse, okay, to show s equals i minus t inverse. Now the author does, does this, but I think he assumes that you could do it by yourself at this point, but I'm going to put a couple more details. Um, what I want to do is, is consider the equation s times i minus t and show that it's the identity. Okay. Um, which takes, maybe I'm being a little bit too much work, but put uh, to show this or s or, or that i minus t times s minus i, the way I'm going to do it, is equal to zero in norm. Okay? That's the lots of ways to write it. Okay? So, um, what I'm going to do is look at the tail, s minus the sum j goes from zero to n. I'm going to need an identity. Use the identity um, i minus t times i plus t plus t squared plus and so on. This is what you always do whenever you do geometric series. So I have to go back to the original thing times t to the n is equal to i minus t to the n plus 1. That's a telescoping, ser uh, telescoping um, identity here. You get i minus t plus t minus t squared plus t squared and so on. So you get this identity. Okay. To show this, okay, so what am I going to do? First, I'm going to have this identity. Then, uh, I know the following. I know the following. By, if I call this star. By star, I'm going to get the following. I have the norm of i minus t times s minus, I'm going to consider just the remainder. j goes from n plus 1 to infinity of t to the j. I already know this sum exists. Okay. And this thing. Minus i. I can think of this as the remainder. Remainder, okay? Not the resolvent, but remainder. <laughs> Maybe r is not a good thing to call it. But um, I better not call it r. But so what is this happening? This, because this simply is, this is the limit of the tail of the series. Okay, so this thing is equal to i plus t plus and so on plus t to the n. Okay, that's what that is equal to. I'm sorry, this wouldn't be the remainder then. This is just partial sum here. Okay. Um, this much, so you get that according to this, then you have that uh, therefore, by that identity over there, this is equal to the norm i minus t to the n plus 1 minus i equals the norm of t to the n plus 1, which is less equal to the norm of t to the n plus 1, which goes to 0. All right. So this whole thing is going to 0. So what does that mean? That means that if I take i minus t minus s, actually, i minus t times s minus i, all right. That's less than or equal to. Well, just you're writing it out. Uh, I've got that's all that i minus t times s minus i is all appearing here, but then there's an extra term. Okay, so this is less than or equal to um, i minus t times sum j goes from n plus 1 to infinity. Here's what I wanted to call the remainder. 
the tail of the series. Okay. Uh, this is this this is what I would have called R, if anything, right here, the remainder. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but so if I do call that R now, then I have I minus T times S is this is the remainder T to the J. Okay. Plus. What am I doing here? I'm writing I minus T S minus I is equal to I minus T um, S minus R. Okay. Minus I. Um, plus I minus T times R. Okay, so I'm, here's my I minus T times R, all right? And this I already estimated in the previous, okay? This I estimated above, and this I'm writing here, okay? So I get this plus the estimate from above. I should have reversed the order to match the order, but there you have a plus T to the N plus 1. Okay. Now, how do I estimate the I minus T times R? Well, that simply is by multiplying norms, again, which is less than or equal to I minus T norm times the norm of this nasty thing, okay, which is less than to the sum of the norms. J goes from N plus 1 to infinity T to the J, okay, since it's convergent already, I can do that, and plus T to the N plus 1, and you can again sum this tail uh, here, as before. So this is less than or equal to the norm of I minus T, which is just some finite number, times T to the N plus 1 over uh, 1 minus the norm of T plus this norm of T to the N plus 1. Okay, so this is getting, it looks kind of roundabout, but this is how I'm getting to make sure that I minus T times S minus I is zero norm because now what I've got is got something which doesn't depend on N at all. Thus that are equal to something that does depend on N but goes to zero. Okay, this goes to zero and therefore you have that I minus T times S minus I is the zero operator. Okay. Okay. Uh, there might have been a slightly easier way to do it, but I don't think so. At least in my good old memory. <laughs> Therefore, this is equal to zero. It's fairly easy to do. But there's the answer. Okay. So you got S is I minus T inverse. And what you've also proved in the end that uh, we're actually a bound for the norm of S, um, I believe, what you've shown also is that um, that the norm of S is less than or equal. Well, this this followed by taking norms in the identity. Okay, so you actually have a bound for the norm of S as well. Okay. Okay, so this is QED. Okay. So what do we get from that? From this little action, what we're going to get is that um, if you've got the complex Bonnach space, then the resolvent set is open and the spectrum is closed. So that's going to come in handy. Okay. So let's get that next term. Any comments about this? And that's the term basically you're going to use for your homework. Looks like I'm not going to get much quantum mechanics in today. We need a couple more weeks. I would dearly love to do the quantum mechanics chapter. Oh, if I would have known it. <laughs> before maybe I would have spent a little bit more energy um, to try to get it done in class 
but some things just stop you. So if there are people who want to study that, it's, it's I highly recommend it. Yeah, it's not that hard You're to get through. Heavy dose of it this fall anyway, so. You're gonna get it anyway. You don't want to see it in advance, huh? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I would highly recommend Christ's egg if you want to do your mathematics on it. Okay. Now, um, so seven three two. Let X be a complex bonus space. Uh, let and let T again be in. Uh, the bonded linear operator for X a complex bonic space. And um, then the resolvent set, which we just wrote up the definition for a few minutes ago, is open. in C. Okay? Remember the resolvent set? And the resolvent set and the spectrum are defined such that their union is all of the complex plane. Okay? So this being open in C, that means the spectrum is closed. Okay? Is open and um, okay. And it turns out that it can't be the null set. Oh, the null set is open, okay. <laughs> but um, that can't happen. In this theorem, it wouldn't matter because I can, I can just be done. If the, null, if the row T is the null set, I am done, okay. But it turns out that it can't be the case. Uh, the author mentions it later um, in this context. So assume that the resolvent is not empty. Okay? Fix lambda not belonging to the resolvent set. Okay? We need to show there exists a whole ball. A ball open ball uh, centered at lambda naught and belonging to resolvent set. Okay, so you've got some you need to show that for each lambda naught in there there's a whole ball around it. Okay. Okay, so what are we going to do? We will we will show that for all lambda in some ball, I'm just, this is of radius epsilon about lambda naught in the complex plane, then uh, we have that. Uh, we excuse me. We will show that for all we have. That's right. We have that. Um, one, R lambda exists on X, and two, um, R lambda is bounded. Okay, so that will be everything I need because uh, that means the domain will be all of X. Okay, and so you'll have. 1 and 3. This is 1 and 3. Okay. <laughs> of the conditions. And 2, R, is, R lambda is bounded. Okay. So how are you going to do that? Well, proof. Uh, so this will finish the job by, uh, by definition. definition of the resolvent set, rho of t. So let's try that. Uh, proof, let write t minus lambda i. First I have to consider this t lambda operator. 
and then I have to invert it. T minus lambda i is equal to T minus lambda naught times i minus lambda minus lambda naught. So take a lambda close to lambda naught here, okay, and write this. And then I can factor out the T minus lambda naught because um, I'm assuming that lambda naught is in the resolvent. So that means that T sub lambda naught does exist, all right? I mean, excuse me, R sub lambda naught does exist. So this means, this in particular implies that R sub lambda naught equals T sub lambda naught to the minus one exists. So I can factor out the T sub lambda naught. So this is equal to T minus lambda naught I times, or T sub lambda naught, remember, is the, the notation is T sub lambda is T minus lambda I. Okay, so sometimes I'll use it, sometimes I won't. Here I'm not. Uh, this will factor out an I here, minus, since the constant commutes with anything, I can just write I minus lambda minus lambda naught times R sub lambda naught. Okay? All right. So that's just an algebraic identity. We can call that T sub lambda naught times some operator V. Okay. Okay, T is bounded. Since T is bounded, did I assume that T was bounded? Yes, we did. We assume that T was a bounded linear operator. That's what we're doing in this chapter. <laughs> okay, so since T is bounded, by assumption. Then, um, by the theorem we just proved, no, no, by that lemma we had at the beginning, the lemma, 7.2 dash 3. Not by the theorem we just did, but by the lemma I did at the beginning, talking about if I've got a bounded linear operator and Let's see, I was a bond linear operator. On a complex Bonnach space, then um, as long as um, then the domain of our lambda is in fact all of X, as long as you're in the resolvent set, okay, in the domain of all of X. Uh, R lambda naught belongs to the bounded linear operators from X to X, so its domain is all of X, okay? Okay. Furthermore, by the business with the geometric series that we just did, that's what I'm going to use next, uh, if lambda minus lambda naught times uh, the norm of R lambda naught is less than 1, then, this, then, um, then V equals the I minus lambda minus lambda naught times R lambda naught has an inverse. Has an inverse that is a bounded linear operator on all of X. Again. So all the operators we're considering so far, all the domains are all of X by what we've got here. Okay? So what can I do with that thing? And also, I can actually write V inverse, okay? And indeed, I can actually write out what V inverse is if I want to. Uh -huh. Indeed, just to recall what we did, V inverse is equal to summation J goes from zero to infinity, lambda minus lambda naught to the J times the resolvent the j power of the resolvent, okay? 
because uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm taking the powers of this thing, okay, from zero to infinity. And that's for lambda minus lambda naught times the norm of R sub lambda naught less than one, okay? Which I can do. I've assumed that R, well, we've got R sub lambda naught is bounded because R sub lambda naught, well, lambda naught was in the resolvent, okay? And that was one of our conditions that R sub lambda naught should be bounded, okay, for the resolvent set. So there is a possibility there for a small enough lambda, that's true. Excuse me, for a small enough lambda minus lambda naught is true. Therefore, uh, T lambda, therefore T lambda is a product of invertible bounded of invertible operators with both inverses in the bounded linear operators so itself is uh, invertible and the inverse is bounded okay therefore T lambda inverse which would be what V inverse followed uh, following T lambda not inverse Okay, is in the bottom linear operators. Okay. Okay, so you've got that part, so you've got one and three and two. One, two, and three. <laughs> okay. Okay. QET. Okay, so what's the corollary? Corollary is that um, if T is a bond linear operator, then in fact the spectrum is compact. Okay. Why is that? Okay, because if you are because if uh, lambda is large enough, then in fact you're in the resolvent. That's the whole point. So we've got we're in the complex plane. We already know the spectrum is closed. We'll also show that it's bounded as long as T is bounded. So the corollary is, I think these are the same conditions, right? We assumed that we had a bounded linear operator. Corollary, 7.3-4. I just doesn't want to put it all as one theorem. Okay. <laughs> okay. He's been pretty good that way. He's writing up things into pieces. Um, if... T again belongs to the bond linear operators from X to X, where X is a complex bonic space. Then the spectrum sigma of T equals the comp okay is is compact in C complex plane. Okay. Proof. Okay, in fact, lies in and, in fact, lies in the disk um, at the value of lambda less than or equal to the norm of t. Okay, so it's compact and lies in there. Right. So all I need to show is that, is that it does lie in there. Okay, and then by uh, the previous theorem will be done because of the characterization of a compact subset of the complex plane being closed and bounded. Okay. So proof. Show that if lambda is bigger than the norm of T, then lambda belongs to the resolvent set. Okay. Okay. Well, if this if lambda is bigger than T, then again we're just going to work this out. Then T minus lambda I, okay, inverse. How can I play with that? I can write that as minus one over lambda. Okay, pull a one, minus one over lambda out, and get write this as I minus 
um, t over lambda to the minus one. <laughs> okay, he's just playing with constants. Okay. So uh, we're done. All right. This um, by the previous theorem so exists since the norm of t over lambda okay is less than one okay thus r lambda is in the body linear operators from x to x by the theorem on the geometric series 7.3-1 So I'm just going to write, uh, again, it's just a corollary, 7.3-1. The compactness was not a corollary of 7.3-1. The, the fact that the, re, that the spectrum lies in this disk was an immediate corollary of 7.3-1. And then, therefore, by the previous theorem, since the uh, resolvent is open, the spectrum is closed, and therefore we have the closed and bounded. Okay. Other comments about this? Kind of that, that spectral theory. It's only one time we had to use that lemma um, that it started with. But that was more interesting, I guess, of the proofs. But <laughs> okay, uh, in terms of its complication. Um, but anyway, this idea is not too bad. So now you have a couple applications in your homework. I think we gave one example last time. The last time we lectured, at the very end of the hour, we talked about 7.3, problem number one, where, in fact, um, you do actually characterize this compact set seven point three number one. I did mention about that just a little bit. Um, The compact set was the range. You had the T mapping C01 back to C01. And your mapping was Tx is some continuous function V on the unit interval Tx at T equals V of T times X of T. So you're multiplying the continuous function by another continuous function. Okay, then it turned out that the spectrum sigma of t, this is a bounded linear functional, and the, and the bound was simply equal to the norm of v as an element of the Banach space. So, so this, this gives that the norm of t is not very difficult to show because you can take x equal to the constant function 1. The norm of t was equal to the norm of v. Okay. Sigma t, so then you had the bounded linear operator on the Banach space. So you can take these as complex value, complex uh, valued functions. And um, so the spectrum is inside this disk norm of lambda less than or equal to the norm of V, which is the maximum absolute value of V, okay? Equals the max absolute value of T. Excuse me, absolute value of V of T, T belonging to the unit interval, okay? So, and then sigma T just turned out to be the compact set, which is the, um, the range of V, okay? V is a continuous function. Okay, on a compact set, therefore, uh, its image is compact. Okay. Since you're working uh, with metric spaces, okay. <laughs> metric space theorem, continuous image of a compact is compact. Okay. So this turned out to be the compact set. So that, that was an example where you could actually find it exactly, and you were supposed to fill in the details on that problem.
Let's see, there was another one. And then you were... And then in another case, in problem number nine, you actually showed the whole closed unit disk is the spectrum. And that every element in that closed unit disk was an eigenvalue. Okay? So 7.3 number 9 was another kind of a nice example because it showed that um, I think there the norm of t was equal to 1. And again, um, the same context, you have a bonded linear operator on a complex Bonnach space. And in this case, then sigma of t was the whole closed unit disk, the set of all lambda with absolute value less than or equal to 1 in C, okay? And moreover, every value of lambda there was an, actually an eigenvalue. Then they ask you, can you extend this? Okay? Uh, that was the case of L infinity. The next problem. All right, so... Um, so some strange things, you know, perhaps. <laughs> some good examples play with as the beginning steps in this subject. So we'll have to skip chapter 9 and we're going to have to skip chapter 11. <laughs> I'm sorry. And chapter 10. <laughs> okay, are there any questions? Okay. Yeah. All right. I think we'll bid you adieu then and um, we'll see you in, uh, in the next course. <laughs>